Today, my name is Danny Martinez. I am an associate professor in the School of Education and currently chair of the graduate group in education. Uh, I want to thank you for joining us for the fall 2020 virtual edition of the School of Education's Brown Bag Speaker Series. Um, today, uh, we will begin shortly with um, Dr. Ga Yung Chung. And I just want to remind you all that next week we will be joined by Dr. Gloria, Gloria Rodriguez, Rodriguez and Dr. Enrique Aleman followed by Dr. Megan Welsh, and we will wrap up our fall um, speaker series with Dr. Alexis Patterson. I also wanted to let you all know, um, I don't have a speaker available, but on November Thursday, November 19th, we will have Dr. April Baker-Bell joining us for our um, Expanding Equity in Educational Research speaker series. That's gonna happen from 5 to 7 p.m. And for graduate students in the room, I wanna let you all know that you'll get some information about this soon. We will, um, Dr. Break, April baker Bell will be hosting a, a graduate student only um, writing, um, writing workshop before her um, larger session at 2 p.m. So you'll be getting instructions and information about that and how to join her in that um, writing workshop soon. So, I'm going to begin our session today by welcoming Dr. Gayung Chung, Dr. Gayung Chung, um, to the School of Education and to the Graduate Group in Education's um, Brown Bag Speaker Series. Give me one second. Um, okay. Um, Dr. Chung is a community-based scholar activist whose work examines the surge of dislocation precarity, and immobility in the era of uneven globalization. Centering on political activism and resistance of undocumented migrants, she impacts how the meaning of citizenship is dismantled, rearticulated, and reassembled in the Asia Pacific. Dr. Chung is currently revising her book manuscript entitled Unexpired, Undocumented Korean Youth Activism, Citizenship and the Radical Future. Informed by inter interdisciplinary insights from comparative ethnic studies, critical Korean studies and transnational migration studies. Her work is dedicated to expanding the field of Asian American studies. Dr. Chung has a PhD in educational policy studies from the College of Education at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign with a concentration in global studies and education. She has both BAs and MAs in sociology from Yonsei University in South Korea. When I asked her where her homes are, Dr. Young um, mentions that home for, home for her is in Seoul, South Korea, and um, like myself in Los Angeles, California. <clears throat> her favorite foods are homemade kimchi stew and boba tea. And when she's not engaged in scholarly work, um, she is currently, in, she joins phone banking for voter registration with her affiliated nonprofit centers, and she enjoys walking her three dogs. So please help me welcome Dr. Ga Young Chung, Assistant Professor in Asian American Studies here at um, UC Davis. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here on Monday afternoon. And also, um, thank you so much, Dr. Martinez and members of Graduate Group in Education for having me here today. So today I will be presenting part of research project on undocumented Korean immigrants. And today's work is entitled, Destabilizing the Undocumented Korean Box, Race, Education, and Undocumented Korean Immigrant Activism for Liberation. So um, before we begin, um, I want to briefly introduce my overall research interest. So through my research, I examine how the meanings and practice of citizenship have been reassembled and rearticulated through Asian Americans' experiences with education and schooling. As a scholar in education and ethnic studies, my research interest is also grounded in the internationalization and privatization of new liberal public higher education and racism on campus. And here are my um, current ongoing research projects. Um, I'm currently working on uh, my book manuscript on the undocumented Korean immigrant youth citizenship and the unending Cold War and militarized citizenship of both undocumented and internationally Korean male students have been in my research projects as well. 
and I'm most interested in the LGBTQ Asian and Asian American students and the meaning of US higher education as a refuge. And lastly, my work is also embedded in the transnational space of citizenship and international Korean student returnees in Asia Pacific. So um, today's research talk is part of my big book project, which is entitled currently on making, making deserving citizens, education, activism and military service and undocumented Korean immigrant youth. So let me begin by sharing Jin Hee's story. Jin Hee is a 27 year old undocumented Korean youth activist from Los Angeles, California. One summer afternoon in June 2016, Jin Hee told me about her life as an undocumented Korean at a cafe in Koreatown, Los Angeles. There is an undocumented Korean box. This box is transparent and invisible, so nobody knows you are caged. You will never get targeted or profiled like Latinx because you Koreans don't look like an undocumented but there are internal struggles coming from our Koreanness, our Korean family and Korean values. Sometimes you may try to challenge the box of glass, but whenever you reach out your hands to the things outside the box, you realize it's not allowed to you. They will say no to you. Instead, you see your parents making sacrifices for you and your community saying to you, like, you will be fine as long as you study hard. In the end, you get to learn that staying inside the box might be the best way to protect yourself because you can't completely be apart from your family and community who are Korean, end quote. Remembering her adolescence as a time she was without any legal protection because it was be before DACA came out to the world. Jin Hee related how different modes of racialization and expectations shaped her identity as an Asian American and undocumented. The modern minority image combined with parental sacrifices and the ethnic community's dominant social norm created apprehensions among Asian undocumented immigrants that both parallels and differs from that of the Latinx undocumented community. She also remembered it forged the particular dynamics of being Asian American and undocumented that remained invisible for a long time to the broader undocumented immigration movement and to the Asian American community. However, despite the pressure of not being able to break out of the undocumented Korean box, the realities of being Korean and undocumented have motivated so many of them into activism. Jin Hee and others have been ceaselessly challenging the pressures for non-dissent through organizing rallies, giving speeches at press conferences, conducting community reach outs, or creating artworks, written works, and videos. And in doing so, undocumented Korean immigrant youth have formed a new political subjectivity to become one of the leading group in the undocumented immigrant activism movement in the United States. Located as they are between, like on one hand, the modern minority logic that relies on education, hard work, and political passivity as pathway to mobility, and on the other hand, nearly completely neglected and invisible, I argue that undocumented Korean and Asian immigrant activists are uniquely positioned to challenge the deserving disposable narrative frame undocumented immigration and the immigration justice movement. Focusing on the narratives of those who spent their teenage years and parts of their 20s without any legal protections before DACA came out in 2012, I explore how the undocumented Korean activists opposed the racism of exclusionary immigration policies, the legacy of US imperialism, and newer threats posed by neoliberal capitalism. 
Using the critical race theory that inspires us to consider the socio historical approaches in understanding the experiences of ethnic sub populations, I also pay attention to how transnational Korean ideologies of the ideal youth citizen has affected the identity formation of the young undocumented Koreans. In focusing on their activism, I also attend to such contradiction to demonstrate how these young activists are transforming the US society into a more inclusive and democratic space for all. And I also examine how they have created radical spaces for racial dialogue through multiracial and intersectional solidarity with other minoritized groups. So in doing so, I ultimately argue that young undocumented Korean immigrants are helping envision a new vision of Asian American activism in an era of continued US imperialism and uneven globalization. Currently, there are about 1.7 million undocumented Asian immigrants, comprising 16% of the nation's 11 million undocumented immigrants. According to the data, the size of the undocumented Asian immigrants increased more than three times from nearly 500,000 in 2000 to more than 1. 1.1 million in 2015, and therefore has made them the most rapidly growing undocumented group in the United States. Among them, 192,000 are undocumented Koreans. Being the eighth largest undocumented population in the US, it is known that one out of every seven Korean immigrants are undocumented. In spite of this remarkable statistic, the undocumented Asian immigrants have not received much attention publicly. Instead, the media has largely invoked the modern minority image to frame them as hardworking immigrants poised for high, high socioeconomic success, like so-called undocumented modern minority. But much has been changing as Korean and Asian American undocumented youth make visible their conditions and their resistance. My research draws on four years of multi-sided and community-based participatory research from 2013 and 2017. I conducted my research in Los Angeles, Chicago, New York, and Virginia, where large Korean immigrant communities are located. In each area, I worked closely with Korean American organizations, such as the Korean Resource Center in Los Angeles, the HANA Center in Chicago, the Minkwon Center in New York, and the National Korean American Service and Education Consortium in Annandale, Virginia. By working, cooking, and living together with undocumented Korean youth activists, I was able to gain a deeper understanding of their life experiences. As time went by, my responsibility and roles in their activism increased as well. I worked as a campaign organizer summer youth program facilitator, media contact, and translator for ethnic media outlets. By contributing to their activism with my ability as a native Korean speaker and former experiences organizing undocumented migrant workers back in South Korea, I was able to participate and contribute to the community I was researching. Whereas I was called as a doctorate student from Illinois at the beginning of my field work, at some point, I was more often called a Korean Korean sister and a supporter of undocumented Koreans and later a fellow activist. With the consent and support of my research interlocutors, I conducted interviews with 122 people, including undocumented Korean youth activists, their parents, community organizers, and non-Korean undocumented activists. The undocumented Korean youth activists ages raised from 19 to 35. They were born in South Korea between 1982 and 1998. So all the specific cases in my research are based on the ethnographic data that I acquired by working with and interviewing my research participants. 
So in my uh, first part of this research talk, I want to talk about the first part of the dual role of education among them. The undocumented Korean youth who participated in my research believed in the promise of education for a better future during the time they spent in their K-12 education. It was before DACA came out to the world, there was no way for them to get the pathway to the citizenship. And I found three commonalities in their narratives that shaped their educational aspirations. So they were, First, their desire to reward their parents' sacrifice through educational attainment. Two, the transnational Korean state ideology of meritocracy in combination with the Korean American community's belief in the modern minority myth. Three, the US policy and law that sends the message that only educated and moral undocumented youth would be protected by the state. So overall, the youth were consistently expected to be well-educated and remain moral so that they could contribute to their own future. So Jin He's story that opened today's talk speaks to the pressure to maintain the behaviors of respectability aligned with Korean meritocracy and the US imposition of Asian American representations of success. Kyung Eun, the other research interlocutor from Pasadena, California, also shared an akin story to Jin Hee's. Kyung Eun was born in Incheon, South Korea in 1990 and came to the United States after her family went bankrupt during the 1997 Asian financial crisis. This crisis, shaped by global capitalism, caused the collapse of the middle and middle lower class and led to new social phenomena, such as increase in family separations, suicides, and homelessness in South Korea. For some families, like Kyung-un's families, leaving South Korea was an inevitable choice to survive. They headed to the United States, where Kyung-un's uncle lived in Koreatown, Los Angeles, seeking for a new hope. While working day and night at a restaurant, gas station, and liquor shop under the table without days off, Kyung Eun's parents hired a lawyer to obtain green cards for the family. It was only seven years later when the lawyer disappeared did their parents realize that they had been scammed. Kyung Eun was in the ninth grade when her parents informed her that she was undocumented. While she was frustrated about her legal status, she pushed herself to study hard as a way to repay her parents' sacrifice and hope for educational achievement. The issue of education was deeply interconnected with how they thought about not only the future of their own, but their family's dream for tomorrow. Meanwhile, the undocumented Korean youth's hope for education was also impacted by the transnational Korean state's ideology of meritocracy shared by their parents and the ethnic community. Yumi, an undocumented Korean youth from New Jersey said, and I quote, elderly Koreans in K-Town often said, there will be a good day in the future as long as you believe hamyeon denda, you can do it in Korean and work hard. Growing up in the Korean community, I knew how the folks in community degraded the illegals, comparing them to the Korean Americans, quote unquote, the good immigrants. I knew I was undocumented, so there was certain pressure that I should do my best at school so that I could be free from, quote, illegals, the lazy and irresponsible cheaters, end quote. I tried my best to fit the Korean American phenotype, end quote. After the Korean War in the 1950s, South Korea was completely in ruins. After decades, its rapid recovery from the war and the economic growth rendered the sense of pride, confidence, and most importantly, belief in merit meritocracy, that anyone is able to acquire better economic status and power as long as one is well-educated and work hard. Young people adopted the transnational Korean state's ideology of meritocracy and hardworking good immigrants, but this ideology was also strongly reinforced by the tenets of the modern minority myth. 
U.S. law and immigration policy also sends the message that only educated and moral undocumented youth would be protected. For instance, Plyler video that guaranteed K-12 education for undocumented children, regardless of their legal status, aimed to educate children in consideration of their becoming possible future U.S. citizens. The value of education for undocumented children and youth in the United States was defined in terms of its utility for the state, as shown in the document that you can see from the slide now. Along with their right to be educated was the expectation that they would contribute to the United States in case they become citizens in the future. Likewise, you find similar value placed on education in the DREAM Act, which was introduced to provide permanent residency for certain undocumented immigrant youth for the first time in 2001. And later it became the model for DACA. Here is a part of a speech made by Dick Durbin, one of the two senators who introduced the DREAM Act. As you can find from this slide, his speech creates a divide between undocumented youth who could become ideal youth citizens and those who could not. And in doing so, situates undocumented youth within normative political state ideology. And in this regard, the DREAM Act can be understood as a gesture on the parts of the government for selective inclusion for undocumented immigrants. Like as long as they are young, educated and moral, the qualities deemed as future assets for the United States. So in sum, although the education aspiration of undocumented Korean youth came from different sources, they converged on the same goals. Young people believed that education would guarantee a stable future with state inclusion. However, they started to see the limits of the redemptive value of education and their inability to access this future promise of state acceptance because it was before DACA came out. So there was no way for them to find a job and get the tuition fee assistance from the government or any other organizations. They felt betrayed. So most of my research interlocutors, like without a social security number, work permit and driver's license, they could not freely move, work, or plan for their postgraduate life. Hence, they began to fully realize that their liminal legal status was not going to be served by their education pursuits. Activism became a mold for some young people to channel their frustration. So now I turn to the second part of my research talk that discusses how in their activism, they found a different kind of value in education, what I call education as a tool for critical action and liberation. They had formerly aspired to embrace the neo river value of education, but once they became involved in activism, they learned about the progressive knowledge created and practiced by various activists from other marginalized groups. It brought them a sense of education as liberatory practice. I observed how undocumented youth began to re-envision a new future through their activism. And it occurred in three distinct waves, prior to DACA, during DACA, in after DACA. For the purpose of my project, the first wave of Korean undocumented student activism started in Los Angeles with the Alliance of Korean American Students in Action, which I will call Akashia hereafter. Consisting of undocumented Korean youth, the Akashia worked to obtain in-state tuition and federal financial aid coverage for undocumented students. As many of you here may be aware, the California Assembly Bill 540 was passed in 2001 to provide access to in-state tuition rates for undocumented students in California's public colleges and universities. However, even up to the early 2010s, the administrative staff in higher education or teacher and counselors in secondary education were often ignorant of this bill. They did not adequately communicate the assistance available to undocumented students or even told them about their ability to enroll in universities. As a result, some undocumented students abandoned their plans for attending college. 
activists took up this challenge. And Chang Hun from Acacia told me how he became more passionate about his activism. He said, quote, some undocumented Koreans were rejected by college and reached out to us. They were afraid of even talking to the college officer in person due to their legal status. There was no DACA yet, so it was not a delusion. We helped them out. We visited the administrative offices explaining about AB 540, and then students finally got admissions. We felt achieved from helping the other undocumented students. The more we learned about their struggles and advocated that they shouldn't be discriminated against higher education, the more we realized our activism mattered. We continued to fight against institutional restrictions and expanded our activism, end quote. In response, Acacia members passionately mobilized to raise awareness about AB 540 of over the four years between 2008 and 2012, they made almost 200 visits at education institutions and helped their peer groups gain access to higher education. Acacia members also fought against tuition increases, showing that they were broadening their advocacy for educational access. In the fall of 2009, for instance, the University of California system voted to increase student tuition by 32% to a total of $10,000 per year per undergraduate student. Not only did it affect undocumented students, but also other underprivileged students got affected by it. The youth activists asked the public universities to provide more inclusive accessibility and financial resources to undocumented students through the practice of petition drives, rallies, sit-ins, and civil disobedience. As Akashia members became passionate defenders of higher education, they together asked fundamental questions about the broad value of education, such as who is to be protected and cared for in higher education, who belongs and who speaks in our universities, and whose university is it? In doing so, they pushed the conversation about the ideals of public higher education at a time when it was rapidly becoming corporatized and privatized. In some sense, they helped to conserve the values of higher education by strongly reminding us to remain it as an inclusive and democratic space for students. The DREAM Act played a huge role in expanding the undocumented Korean youth activism. Once it was proposed in 2001, it never passed the Congress for a decade. As discussed earlier, the DREAM Act was a limited form of immigration reform for undocumented persons because of its methods of selective permission and approval guidelines. Despite of its shortcomings, however, many activists considered it to be the most feasible goal to achieve legal status at the time. The Undocumented Korean Youth Activists of my research supported the bill, hoping to move forward to address comprehensive immigration reform later. Their attempts to dismantle the racialized and exclusionary immigration policy continued through various actions ranging from educational events to giving speeches at press conferences, rallies, and protests outside of governmental buildings. In 2010, undocumented Korean youth activists in New York gave a speech at a press conference representing the voice of the undocumented Asian immigrants in solidarity with undocumented Latinx activists. In Chicago at May Day rally in the same year, undocumented Korean youth and their allies played Korean pungmu drums and urged the government to respect working class immigrants' rights. In this process, undocumented Korean youth began to develop a critical analysis of racism and forge multiracial alliances. They met with day laborers, domestic workers, senior Asian American activists, undocumented Latinx activists, and African American community organizers. These connections provided a different kind of education for the undocumented Korean youth, including Bo Young from Chicago. She said, quote, it was an eye-opening experience. 
Through the activism, I met with the activists from other generations with different backgrounds. It was like I was reading a new history textbook about the land I lived in. Nobody taught me things like that until I went to college. It was only when I became an activist that I began to understand the critical issues from the structure and history of the US society. My shame and anxiety disappeared and I felt unaf unafraid. I wanted to help the others to be out of the shadows and feel the liberation too." End quote. Like Bo Young, the youth activists gained the knowledge they did not fully learn from their former education through mutual engagement with other activists. By gaining perspectives to critically understand the social system from civil rights, the Black Power movement, and the history of Asian Americans, the youth activists found the value of education to pursue their liberatory and progressive future. And in 2012, former President Barack Obama announced DACA as an executive order. DACA had similar components to the DREAM Act in that it also aimed to fulfill the state's need to maintain productivity and efficiency. But DACA provided a renewable work permit, social security number, and exemption for deportation. It inspired more undocumented Korean youth during the activism without fear of de deportation. So a lot of undocumented youth activists from the pre-DACA period continued their activism with the new members. And young people's practice of liberatory activism was most evident during what was called the Dream Writers Across America conducted in 2013 and 2015, and the Undocu AAPI Black Action in 2017, which I was part of. So inspired by the Freedom Writers of 1961, the undocumented Korean youth activists organized Dream Writers Across America 2013. The purpose of this road trip campaign was to raise awareness about undocumented Asian immigrants in solidarity with Vietnamese and Filipino youth and to celebrate the first anniversary of DACA. I participated in this effort as a campaign coordinator. We drove from the nation's capital in Washington, DC to cities throughout Virginia, North Carolina, Georgia, Louisiana, and Texas. So we held a presentation at the White House for Asian American summer interns, but with Arne Duncan, the former Secretary of Education, and had a workshop with the Freedom University, an underground Georgia institution providing undocumented young people with tuition-free college courses. We also reached out to various immigrant communities, communities of color, labor, and faith. In this process, the youth activists raised their voices to advocate for undocumented youth who were ineligible for DACA, calling attention to undocumented high school dropouts, undocumented people in their early 30s who just over DACA's age limit, and the overall invisibility of undocumented Asian immigrant youth. In 2015, this group organized the second national road trip campaign consisting of Vietnamese, Philippinex, Latinx, and Black youth in 12 different cities in nine states to illustrate how racialized illegality has shaped similar yet unique struggle among different racial groups. They had community meetings with youth members of the Southeast Asian Coalition in Charlotte, North Carolina, and so they facilitated a workshop with Vietnamese youth in New Orleans about the post Katrina struggles. And they also met with social justice activists in Selma, Alabama to discuss about the history of race and illegality. So these efforts seeking to practice an expansion of the liberatory value of education-based activism from the multiracial and intersectional solidarity in connection with the contemporary injustice issues. The very last case of political and education collaboration was called the Undocu Black AAPI Action held in Washington DC in 2017. 
Undocumented Korean youth activists coordinated the workshop with Black youth from the Southern Africa and Central America to create radical spaces for racial dialogue. Its purpose was to show the collective response to DACA's official cancellation and to ask Congress to pass a new act protecting undocumented immigrants. About 110 members gathered to discuss the significance of bringing non-Latinx undocumented groups struggles into the public eye. They examined how Asian and Blacks have been manipulated to perpetuate racism, which confirmed their understanding of structural racism. They also discussed the Asian Blacks interracial conflicts during 1992 early uprising and interracial solidarity in initiatives such as Black Lives Matter. In doing so, they forged solidarity based on their minoritized identities continuing the history of the multiracial movement and solidarity within their current political moment. A neutral education process doesn't exist. Education either functions to facilitate the integration of generations into the logic of the present system to instill conformity, or it becomes the practice of freedom the means by which people deal critically with reality and discover how to participate in the transformation of their world. My research into Rokura's experience reflects these two aspects of education. Their aspiration for education was shaped by the pressure to prove their deservingness to become citizens. But education also became a venue and subject for them to fight for justice for every student. Through this education-based activism conducted in solidarity with the other marginalized groups, they resisted racism, U.S. imperialism, and new liberal capitalism. The critics that undocumented Korean activists have made are evident everywhere. Currently in 2020, we are witnessing some disturbing changes in education. Public higher education is being rapidly privatized and neoliberalized with noticeable budget cuts and restrictions. Universities are praising for diversity while they are less involved in critical debates over ongoing racism on campus. Hate speeches targeting people of color and anti-immigration discourses are growing both on and off campuses. At this critical moment, the voices of undocumented Korean students remind us that we must reject the imposition to accept gains for the so-called deserving at the expense of the so-called disposable. The immigration right movement itself is in a moment of transformation, making greater demands for justice outside the objective of former citizenship and creating new ways of living in community and collectively resisting inequalities. At present, the undocumented Korean youth activists are confronted with the fear of deportation more than ever before, after they have done their very best, not only for themselves, but for other marginalized groups. When DACA was rescinded in 2017, they felt their futures were threatened once again. In spite of all these challenges, however, they have been continuing their activism. Even right now, they are fighting for the exclusionary immigration system across the nation. Critical education theorist Henry Zero noted that we begin to rethink and reform the oppressive, oppressive system by asking questions about the forms of resistance already employed by our students and young people. What should we do after we learn about the struggles and hope of the undocumented Korean, Asian, Latinx, and Black immigrant youth? In the shadow of racism and uneven globalization, they remind critical scholars and students of education and acting studies, such as ourselves, the, pur the purpose of education. As Paulo Freire pointed out, education cannot be divorced from politics. 
In particular, education has been a foundational theme in the fields of Asian American studies and ethnic studies. As we all well know, ethnic studies was born 50 years ago by a protest movement in higher education that was part of a larger social movement to change US society's power structure and racialized culture of its institution and international relations. The struggles and education-based activism of the undocumented Korean youth not only furthers the legacy of the value of education in Asian American studies, but also helps us reimagine the world we want to live in and the education we should engage in. To return to some numbers I gave at the beginning of this chat, this talk, there are 192,000 undocumented Korean immigrants. 1.5 million undocumented Asian immigrants take up approximately 14% of 11 million undocumented immigrants in the United States. Undocumented Asian immigrants might be invisible to you, but they are everywhere. They might be your neighbors, they might be your coworkers, your students, or your teaching assistants. The future of undocumented immigrants is just one part of how our society reflects its history of settler colonialism and continue to practice the lesson that we found from the birth of Asian American studies and the value of education. I suggest we can start a conversation for these changes in solidarity with the undocumented immigrant youth today. The outcome of these challenges is in our hands right here, right now. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chung. I wanna um, I see folks clapping. I, I really wanna thank you for your talk today. And I can already see that there's a question in the chat room for you. So um, we have time for probably one or two questions, maybe three, but Gloria, do you wanna um, ask your question or do you want me? Go ahead, Gloria, you should ask your question. Oh, sure. First of all, thank you so much for your work. The, what a powerful study and, and, and just your engagement with the community. Uh, thank you so much for providing that example for us. Um, I, I guess my question, I know that the model minority myth and, and narrative are, are multi-layered, it sounds like, from your work for the Korean undocumented community. And so I, and so I know that um, some Latinx scholars have pointed out that you know, the policies that you refer to also portray a new, a, a new model minority myth ap applied to Latinx youth as well. I'm wondering from your work and your experience with, with the um, Korean undocumented community, um, what are some instances that, that you can share with us or even just one where, um, where the youth were able to um, push back on that and, um, and, and maybe, you know, sort of provide a feedback to the policy documents, which, which still to me really, they're dripping with that kind of model minority language. Thank you so much, Gloria. That's an excellent question. So um, I think I can answer your questions for, uh, by using many examples, but uh, one of the things that comes up to my mind first is how their um, narratives or discourse or tactics, tactics in their activism has been changing. For instance, before DACA came out, majority of the undocumented Korean youth activists, regardless of their own perspectives, they were supposed to embrace the value of modern minority publicly. So whenever they had the speeches at the rallies, which was very risky because it was BK before DACA came out, there, there was kind of a shared script, like hidden but not hidden script. So usually they introduce themselves as a, like, I'm an I'm a undergrad student from UC Davis. I'm a student with GPA of 3.5 and I'm majoring in economics. I want to contribute to the United States, but because of my legal status, I can't do it. Something like that. Although there were so, much, so many radical undocumented Korean activists who were not believed in that, um, that perspectives of educational values. And some of them are also queer, undocumented queer Korean youth activists. They had some pressure to not to reveal 
their perspectives of them when they talk to the particularly ethnic Korean media in Los Angeles, Cape Town, for instance. But by having DACA, they were able to come out more honestly because they had to, they uh, had, did not have to deal with that risk of deportation than before. And also uh, by having the rise of the size of this activism, they were able to meet with their peer groups and that's where they found out why and how their radical or progressive ideologies really matter in their activism. And nowadays, when they have some public speeches or um, airing their YouTube videos, reaching out to the other undocumented Korean or Asian or other undocumented youth immigrants, they do not talk about this issue like before. Instead, particularly my um, closest undocumented Korean activists are now pushing some um, ideologies like abolish ICE and the value of mutual aids and citizenship for all. So by citizenship for all, they do not mean that we need to grant citizenship for undocumented immigrants. Their frame includes people with disability, people of color, and people of different age and cultural groups. So by citizenship for all, they uh, they want to push uh, more like in enlarging the social welfare system that can support all the marginalized groups. So now they are really re-envisioning their activism. Thank you for your question, Gloria. Thank you. Thank you so much. Do we have one more question? I have a question. Go ahead. I can't see who's um, speaking. Oh, sorry. It's Annalisa. Um, Annalisa so hello. Thank you for your amazing work. I feel like I've learned so much from your talk today. So I appreciate you and your research. Um, so earlier in the talk, you mentioned how when you first started to work with these activist groups across your four sites, that you know your you kind of evolved first. I think you you say you went from like a Korean sister um, to more of a like a fellow activist. So there was this like this evolution in your role with these various organizations over time. So I just want to know, like for you personally, how has this particular research um, transformed your own personal beliefs in how you uh, one view education and then also how you, um, you know, made, uh, how you view education and then also like how you personally interact with the UC Davis um, community? Thank you so much. That's a really important, important question. So um, back in South Korea, I worked with undocumented migrant workers and their children from other countries in Asia. And back then, I was called as um, immigrant activism organizer, but you know, I was South Korean citizen, for instance, and I was also a master's program student too. I was with a lot of privilege. And when I came to the United States and started working with the undocumented Korean youth activists, of course, it was not easy at the beginning because I myself was not familiar with the language of the grammar of policy or rallies or organizing work of the US. And at the same time, my position as an international student from South Korea meant huge privilege to many of my research participants. Because while I was really one of the welcome, welcomed body in US higher education, they considered they consider themselves as the least welcomed body in public higher education because they were undocumented, they were from working class, and they were unruly students, I mean, as they called themselves. And then I didn't, I even didn't apply for IRB application in my first year of pilot field work. I just went to Los Angeles and I literally lived at the second floor of the organization and just lived there for three months. And I worked like a full-time volunteer and I repeated it every summer and winter for a while. And then when I started fully understanding the grammar of the activism, I mean, not only about the rules, but a lot of gestures or culture of the, the US way of or Korean American way of fighting for justice, I started thinking of conducting research. And after seeing probably my dedication 
commitment for their activism for several years. Some of them already wanted to talk about their stories to me because it was still the time when many people even did not know what DACA meant, for instance. And so many of them still felt really invisible in spite of their consistent efforts for making the undocumented Korean Asian voices visible. So they wanted me to document their voices and I believe it would be my way of doing activism that collect their stories and analyze their um, like perspectives with support and sharing all of these issues with, with people like what I do today. So it has really transformed my understanding about being a scholar and being a scholar activist. Of course, it brought me numerous days and nights of tears and pressures and anxiety because I was not sure if I can make the right representation, like without like not exploiting my research participants' sad stories, struggles, because it's so real. So yeah, I'm still dealing with it. And I still do not know what would be the right answers, but I believe me um, delivering their voices to our campus and trying to work more closely with undocumented Asian and non-Asian students at the campus of Davis can be part of the things that I can do or I should do as a scholar activist. Thank you so much for your excellent question. Dr. Guyung Chang, I want to really thank you your, your, for your powerful work um, on um, and I, I really want us to look, I look forward to your book and reading it soon and teaching it in our uh, courses on qualitative research. And you really, as I'm looking at the comments, provided a, a great example of what scholar activism um, looks like. And, and we're excited to have you here on our campus. So again, I wanna thank you all for joining us. Um, I wanna give a shout out to our PhD students. I want, especially our, our first year PhD students who are in, being introduced, introduced to our PhD program here at the School of Education through this virtual platform. I wanna give a shout out to Candell students who I know were on and have been joining us um, for these Brown Bag um, spe um, speaker series, for this Brown Bag speaker series. And also I saw a few staff on and I just wanna thank you all for taking some time and joining us here. So again, 